Okay, hello and welcome everyone. So in this video, I'm going to talk about price discrimination. So in particular, first degree price discrimination, second degree price discrimination, and third degree. So the key is you have to have firms with market power in order to enact some type of price discrimination. Matter of fact, there's kind of three things you need. Firms have to have some degree of market power. They've got to be able to identify their consumers. They've got to be able to tell them apart and know something about their willingness to pay. And they've got to be able to prevent resale or arbitrage. Otherwise, if you try to offer a discount to one group and charge a premium to another, those with a discount could, could take the item and turn around and sell it to those who would have otherwise faced a premium. All right, so first degree price discrimination, by this we mean personalized prices. By second degree price discrimination, we mean consumers are self-selecting from a menu of options. And by third degree price discrimination, we mean different prices based on relative price elasticity of demand. And actually, we could think of like different prices based on membership in some uh, readily identifiable group, such as like students versus non-students or like adults versus children or something like that. All right, so talk a little bit more about first degree price discrimination. This involves setting the price exactly equal to each individual's willingness to pay. So think about what's the most you'd be willing to pay for something, that's your price, if they're able to practice first degree price discrimination. Problem, well this requires a lot of information. It's really difficult to do in practice. Uh, matter of fact, if we were to give this, if I were to give this lecture, even when I, no, it was already not like that when I was in school, but so like 2001 but before then so like say say maybe a decade before that say like early 90s first degree price discrimination would largely just be a theoretical concept and you'd have some you'd have some examples that would be reasonably arguably close but not really in modern day you can come up with pretty compelling technological strategies for first degree price discrimination it's not typical so the issue with first degree price discrimination isn't like isn't the technology or the information necessarily oftentimes it's like the customer service issue or like the customer relations so think about amazon or think about uber or think about anything that you're purchasing online where you're seeing a bunch of prices choosing to buy and not buy repeatedly and through all these things, the firm is able to glean your willingness to pay. So in principle, could come up with pretty close first degree price discrimination. What's stopping them? Like customer outcry, right? All right, so, but with perfect price discrimination, what this would do is convert all consumer surplus to profit. In this situation, there would be no deadweight loss. So if you're thinking about this, remember what economists think about when it comes to like the cost of market power. I, I, I made this mistake with my slides. I put two on, two on the same page, so I gotta move around on it. So remember what economists think about market efficiency and think about firms with market power is there's a problem with monopoly having to do with deadweight loss, with the fact that there's the monopoly restricts output relative to the competitive market, drives up the price, lowers the quantity, and then there's units that would have been produced by the competitive market that are not produced by the monopoly, and this introduces deadweight loss, inefficiency, foregone gains from trade. That doesn't happen with first degree price discrimination. With first degree price discrimination, the entire area under the demand curve goes to producer surplus. Right? This is my demand curve. This is my, my marginal cost. The entire area under the demand curve is producer surplus. Perfect price discrimination allows a monopolist to produce all the way down to the competitive quantity. Right? Why? Well, we'll, we'll sell at all prices for which that consumer's willingness to pay is above marginal cost. But you won't sell down here because their willingness to pay is below marginal cost. So you'd stop selling here exactly when price is equal to marginal cost. The other thing that's interesting is that the competitive market or the monopoly practicing first degree price discrimination, their marginal revenue curve is the demand curve. Marginal revenue is the additional contribution to revenue from selling one more unit of output. Marginal revenue and demand are one and the same for first degree price discrimination. 
Okay, so I was trying to scroll, it wasn't working. What about second degree price discrimination? Second degree price discrimination is a little bit more involved. So, well, from our perspective. So here you have this menu of options that consumers are choosing from. So the idea is everybody sees the same prices and they choose what they want to, if they want to buy and then which package they want to buy. Each con consumer chooses the offer tailored to them. So this could be like quantity discounts, volume pricing, variations in quality or features. So quantity discounts would be like, is it worth it for you to go and buy the tub of Heinz ketchup at Costco? Or is it fine for you just to go to like Meyer and buy the standard, like, I don't know, what, 20 ounce or whatever? Think about variations in quality. Do you have to have the business grade version of Photoshop or can you get by with the standard uh, household version? You know, so on and so forth. This is particularly useful. Second degree price discrimination is particularly useful when consumers are differing in their preferences, but in a way that's difficult to observe or monitor. Think about the information requirement for, for price discrimination. With first degree price discrimination, the firm has to gather a lot of information, has to know your willingness to pay and offer you that price. With second degree price discrimination, the consumers retain that information, they reveal it by virtue of making their purchase, right? I present this menu of options, consumers buy or don't buy, and then by virtue of observing their behavior, you learn something about the distribution. So my comment, much less information is required to make this effective, you just have to have enough information to be able to set the pricing thresholds correctly and we'll see that so third degree price discrimination this involves separating heterogeneous demanders into smaller homogeneous groupings so for instance hundred thousand people willing to go see a football game big house some are students some are alums some are general public and presumably have much different willingness to pay however there's other ways, so the, so presumably, these different groups can be distinguished by virtue of an observable, verifiable characteristic, like a student ID, senior citizen card, if they have it or don't have it. Also, presumably, holding the student ID is correlated with willingness to pay, and holding a senior citizen card is correlated with willingness to pay, and not having either of these is correlated with willingness to pay. And when that's true, there can be an advantage to the firm than offering third degree price discrimination. So provide a discount to those with the elastic or the price responsive demand subsidized by a price premium charged to those with the inelastic demand. And we'll think about why this works. All right, so what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna talk about third degree price discrimination, then I'm gonna come back and talk about second degree price discrimination. So first the theory, this is following Varian really closely. Suppose the firm is able to identify two different groups of people, it can sell an item to each group at different prices. Our inverse demands for the two groups would be this right here, price in terms of quantity is inverse demand. Suppose the total cost is just cost as a function of my total quantity. This looks scary because I've got, this fun I've got C as a function of a sum. It's not scary, this is C as a function of the total quantity. Q1 plus Q2 is just a quantity. Monopolist problem, therefore, is going to be to maximize profit. So this is maximized by choosing the optimal quantity to sell to each segment of the market, where this is my revenue from market one, this is my revenue from market two, and this is my cost overall. We're assuming it's going to cost the same whether I sell to students or non-students is the idea. right? All right, well, this gives rise to a system of first order conditions, system of equations. So think about how we'd maximize. I mean, one thing you could do is actually differentiate, take the partial with respect to Q1, partial with respect to Q2. Ultimately, simplifying down, this boils down to marginal revenue in market one is equal to marginal cost. Marginal revenue in, mar in market two is equal to market mar marginal cost. And these marginal costs have to be the same, obviously and then you'd solve for the optimal quantity. So my comment here, a couple things, I'll do a numerical example real quick. So the marginal cost, actually I'll do a, I'll, I'll do a variable, uh, an example with variables, then I'll do a numerical example. So marginal cost of producing an extra unit of output must be equal to the marginal revenue in each market. Q1 
given that the marginal cost is the same in each market, the marginal revenue also has to be the same, right? That's just saying like, if this is equal and this is equal, then these two have to be equal to each other. If this is equal to this, then these two have to also be equal. That's all that's saying. So the good should bring the exact same increase in revenue regardless of whether it's sold in market one or market two. That should be intuitive. If you could boost revenue quite a bit more by selling it in market two, you're gonna sell more in market two, less in market one, right? That's sort of like our bang for your buck principle. All right, so here's the variable example. Then I'll show the numerical example. This is actually there's actually some value in seeing this with with letters though, and this is following varying variant as well. Suppose the firm faces two markets with linear demand, so Q1 is equal to A minus B P1, and Q2 is equal to C minus Q, D P2. So these are demands. I want to get inverse demand, so I'll solve these for P. Right? Assume that marginal costs are zero. Oh, wait a second. If marginal costs are zero, then the profit maximizing problem boils down to revenue maximization. And I'll show you that graphically. If the firm's allowed to price discriminate, it'll produce where marginal revenue is equal to zero. Oh, actually, I could show you this here. You want to produce where marginal revenue equals marginal cost. If marginal cost equals zero, you want to produce where marginal revenue equals zero. But marginal revenue equals zero is the condition for maximizing total revenue. Right, take the derivative. Derivative of total revenue is marginal revenue. Setting it equal to zero gives us our first order condition. So this is so we're going to produce where marginal revenue equals marginal cost equals zero, which occurs at a price and output combination halfway down the demand curve. It's going to correspond to the midpoint of the demand curve. Actually, corresponds to where demand is unit elastic. The midpoint of the demand curve, if this is the demand curve, you can think of what the inverse demand curve is going to be. Move this to the other side. It'll be BP1 is equal to A minus Q1 divided through by B. It'll be P1 is equal to A over B and then uh, Q over Q over B. And then here's their, here's their corresponding prices and then quantities. And I know that's horrible, so let me show you this graphically, which I think I hid, hid here. Oh, wait a second. Did I now wait now wait a second I'm getting I'm getting a little bit concerned a little bit a little bit concerned a little bit more concerned because I was very deliberate I was very deliberate in making this and the reason why I wanted to use this particular set and not the one so I know this is great radio so here yeah great radio great Good, good, good. Um, so the reason why I wanted to use this one rather than going and making fresh slides that didn't have two on the same sheet is because this one I made these nice pictures in. So let me see if I've actually saved this here. All right, got it. Sorry about that, but I think it was worth it. It's worth it to me anyway, not stopping the video. Because I now it is uh, 12.33 a.m. And as soon as I'm done with this, I've got to hop on a treadmill and I've got to run several miles because I've got the goal of running 100 miles a week. And a treadmill is a brutal way to run 100 miles a week. And I've got to do it overnight because of, uh, because of the dog. So... Anyway, all right. So here is, that's why I got to make the videos at, at night too, so that the place is quiet. Uh, anyway, so here was where we were, and I left off showing us the prices. Price is equal to A over 2B, and quantity is equal to A over 2. That's because here's my inverse demand corresponding to this demand curve, right? And so this is gonna be my Q intercept. If price is equal to zero, my quantity intercept is A. And if, and then, and then uh, solving here, my vertical intercept is A over B. Okay, the midpoint of this thing is gonna be A over two, and then the midpoint of this thing is gonna be A over, A over two B. That's where this is coming from here. And then the same thing for this demand curve, we're just switching C's and C's or A's with C's and B's with D's, and we've got it. And then the last thing we want to do is suppose the firm were to sell in both markets at the same price. 
it faced a demand curve of a plus c minus uh, quantity b plus d times p. You would similarly produce halfway down the demand curve. So it's going to produce, if this is the horizontal intercept is a plus c, it'll produce a quantity corresponding to where a plus c over 2. And then if this is the vertical intercept, it'll, produce, it'll sell at a price of a plus c over uh, 2 times the quantity b plus d. That's all this is doing right here. And what are we showing? If we have a linear demand curve, linear demand curve for both segments of the market, of course, our overall segment is going to be linear. Look, my quantity I sold over here was a over 2 plus, a plus c over 2. That is a common denominator. a over 2 plus c over 2 is going to be a plus c over 2 which tells us the total output is the same regardless of price discrimination, right? So the prices were different, but the total, the total output is the same whether I sell it in the large market as a whole or as the two individual markets. Oh, where did I get this from? I just pooled these. I just added these together. I took uh, A plus C and then minus B P1 plus minus D P2, and that was that was this right here, but there's not a P1 and P2 because we're just selling at a single price. All right, so this is true for linear demand only, not not uh, general result. Now let me do a numeric example. So here's the numerical example. So suppose a monopolist faces two markets with the following demand. Q is equal to 60 minus P1 and Q is equal to 60 minus 2P2. Assume the mo monopolist marginal cost is $10 per unit. If if they can price discriminate, what price should it charge in order to maximize profits? And what price will it charge if it cannot do price discrimination? All right. Well, when it can do price discrimination, we can treat segment one and segment two as two separate markets. And we'll just do monopoly profit maximization separately in market one and market two. So that's exactly what I do. So here's my demand for market one, demand for market two. I've just generated inverse demand by solving for P. Are solving for P1 here, solving for P2 over here, right? I lost my P2, but this is gonna, that's all this is right here. So, though, all right, so that was my inverse demand. If those are my inverse demands, then my marginal revenue, remember, marginal revenue has the same vertical intercept, but twice the slope as our inverse demand. I'll have another video for that, but you'll, but we've, you know, I've shown that in a couple other places, but the reason, as to why the simple way to be to, to figure this out would be write out profit so profit would be price times quantity minus cost times quantity so you'd literally write out 60 minus q1 that quantity times q1 minus cq1 in this case you'd write out 60 the quantity 60 minus q1 times q1 minus 10 minus minus sorry 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 you'd write out the quantity 60 minus q1 times q1 minus 10q1. You take that derivative and you take the derivative, you'd get this line right here. 60 minus 2q1 is equal to 10. Solving, we get a quantity of 25 and finding the corresponding price, plugging that in right here, you get a corresponding price of 35. Over here, solving this monopoly profit maximization problem, 30 minus 1 half q2 gives rise to a marginal revenue curve with same vertical intercept, but twice the slope. And my quantity is going to be is going to be 20. The corresponding price, 30 minus 1 half 20 is 20. And so then I say, okay, that was this right here. But I actually like my work better than what I did on the slide. So then suppose we're not able to do uh, third degree price discrimination. Suppose we have to pool our demands. Okay, good. Let's do that. Let's add this to this, this demand to this. So it's going to be 60 minus P plus 60 minus 2p is going to be 120 minus 3p. Solving for p, my inverse demand is going to be 40 minus 1 third q. Well, if that's my inverse demand, my marginal revenue is going to have the same vertical intercept, but twice the slope. So it's going to have 40 minus 2 thirds q is my marginal revenue is equal to my 10 is my marginal cost. And solving, I'll get a quantity of 45 and a price of 25. But hey, look, q1 plus q2, 25 plus 20 is 45. That's exactly what we showed before. Right, my quantity was 25 and 20. That's what we found up here. 25 and 20. If I add those up, I get the same quantity that I that I have in the in the market as a whole. So remember, with linear demand, you'll say you'll sell the same quantity in the whole market as you would 
total between the two markets. So that's actually a good way to kind of check your work. The other thing is look at this price. This price for the whole market is going to be 25, but relative to that price, market one is paying a premium. They're paying a price of 35. Market two is getting a discount. They're paying 20 instead of 25. Well, remember what I said before is that what's driving this is the relatively more elastic or inelastic demand. Here's demand one, relatively more inelastic, so they pay the higher price. You can see this from the graph. They're the one paying the 35 price. The flatter demand curve, the more elastic, they're the one getting the discount, the 20 price. All right, sure enough, this right here. How do we know that demand that this demand's more inelastic? Remember, the more vertical is the demand curve, the more inelastic. Look how I wrote this. So inelastic, it's the I with the arrow telling us that that's like the vertical demand curve. So um, so I had I had originally did it, and then for the for the elastic one, you could write like capital E, and then it's a horizontal, and you make the little arrows with the middle bar of a capital E. I used to do it with a lowercase e, and then Justin Wolfers was, was like, no, you should do it with the capital E, and then it's consistent. And I was like, okay. Let's do it that way then. <laughs> so, um, all right. So let's compare the profits then between the markets. So why? So why would we care about third degree price discrimination? Well, it increases profits. So let's see why. Here's what. Here's the profits from market one. So here's the price, thirty five. Here's the quantities, twenty five. So thirty five times twenty five minus 25 times 10. This is revenue minus cost is 625. And then here's revenue again, uh, Q2 times P2. So 20 times 20 minus cost again is 200. Summing this up, it's 825. What if I calculate profits from my joint market? So if I, if I can't, if I have to treat the two segments as one, then it's gonna be 45 times 25 minus 45 times 10, it's 675, right? So we've increased profits by using third degree price discrimination. Here's an example from the slides and here's the solution. Suppose the monopolist sells in two markets, faces demands given by inverse demand of 119 minus 2Q1 and inverse demand of 123 minus 5Q2. Marginal cost is constant at three. What is the profit maximizing combination of quantities when, they're, when they are able to price discriminate? All right, so I'm going to take 119 minus 2Q1. The marginal revenue has the same vertical intercept but twice the slope, so I'm going to double this. So I have 119 minus 4Q1 is equal to 3. Solving, I'll have 116 is equal to 4Q1, and then Q1 is equal to 29. Isn't that cool? Like, look at this. Here's, it's like odd, even, odd, even, 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 odd, and prime. So there you go. <laughs> Well, there you go. All right, so then we have 125 minus 5Q2, and so then we'll have 123. Whoops, this is, I have 125. Sorry, sorry, sorry. I was getting ahead of myself. Uh, this is actually, I should have made this um, a 3. 123 minus 10Q2 is 3. Uh, solving, why? Because same vertical intercept, if I could write this correctly, maybe I'll, I don't know. So this should be 120. 3 minus 5q2 is what I want there. This looks, looks, looks like q squared, but it's not. Yeah, so, eh, that's horrible. Anyway, so solving, we get a quantity of 12. So what's the profit maximizing quantities when we're able to price discriminate? 29 plus uh, 29 and 12. All right, let's check your understanding. What's the profit maximizing quantity when the firm is not able to price discriminate? Yeah, it's going to be the 29 plus 12, right? Because we have linear demand curves. Okay. So now let's talk about second degree price discrimination as promised. So a second degree price discrimination, remember we have our consumers are able to choose from a menu of prices. Choosing from a menu of prices. Everybody faces the same prices and they're going to choose which package is right for them. So we have a problem. The people with high valuations might pretend to be low valuation people and run with the with the run off with the extra surplus. If we extract too much surplus from either group, either they won't buy at all, or they won't buy at all, or they'll buy the wrong one. So our solution: try to make the low valuation people exactly indifferent between buying and not buying, 
Let's try to make the high valuation people just exactly prefer the high price choice designed for them rather than low price option. This is, you want your business grade, your commercial grade, you want your commercial grade people to be buying the commercial grade software and you want your household grade people to be buying the household software. I mean, you'd like them to buy the commercial grade software, but they're not going to. What you don't want is you don't want the commercial grade people buying the household software. That's what this last one's saying. So my comment, this is the answer to the question of why not set price high equal to 100 later in the lecture. So you're gonna have this question, you're like why not set price up equal to 100? Here's the answer. So I put this on the slides. And I'll, and I'll reinforce that again. And then all the other video, all the example videos that I've got on second degree price discrimination make a similar big deal out of that. All right, so here's an example. Marginal cost of the product for a low quality version, it's 10, high quality version is 40. We have two consumers, two consumer types, type A and type B, low quality and high quality. These are their valuations. This is their maximal willingness to pay. The maximal willingness to pay of consumer type A for the quality, high, for the low quality is 40 for the high quality is 60, maximal willingness to pay for the consumer type B for low quality is 50, high quality is 100. We have 100 of each consumer type, and they only desire to buy one unit of the product. They never buy both high and low quality versions, right? So this is not bundling. It's not bundling because we don't have two distinct products sold for the same price. We have two different products sold for different prices. All right, so now we're gonna walk through this example Suppose we only sell the low quality version. What price do we want to set? We want to set a price of $40. Then profits are $6,000. Suppose we only sell the high quality version, our optimal price is $100. Then our profits are $6,000. Why? Well, if we only sell one version and we, sell, we want to sell the low quality version, if we sell for $40, then we're going to, make, we're going to sell to all 200 consumers. If we set the price of $50, we're only going to sell to 100 consumers. What about selling the high quality good? If we sell at the price of 60, we'll sell to both consumers. But this is a big difference. 100 versus 60 is $40 difference. If I sell at $100, I'll only sell to 100. But that's actually profit maximizing. You should check for yourself, actually. If I, if I sell to both groups, it's 40 minus 10 is my marginal cost times the 200 I sell to, 6,000. If I set the price of 100, 100 minus 40 is you know $60 profit or $60 markup times the 100, 100 consumers is 6,000. Right, so that's what we want to do. Now suppose you sell both versions instead of just one version. The optimal prices now are set the low quality equal to $40, set the high quality at 89 or 90. And then the question, why not 100? Well, remember, matter of fact, I better probably go over this the concept here before I teach the numbers. We have two problems. Problem is, people with high valuations might pretend to be low valuation people and run off with extra surplus. So we wanna to try to make the high valuation people just prefer the high price choice designed for them rather than the low price choice. So obviously I wanna set my low quality price equal to $40. If I set the low quality price higher, my low, my low valuation people, my type A people aren't gonna buy. So that part's relatively straightforward. My profits for, from them is gonna be 40 minus the marginal cost of 10 times the 100 consumers. What about my price of my high quality item? I wanna set the price at 90. So then my marginal cost, right? Marginal cost was 40. So my profit, my markup's gonna be, oops. My markup's gonna be 50 uh, times the, over the 100 that I'm selling to. Now suppose I were to sell at a different price. You might say, oh wait a second, why don't I set the price of low quality equal to 40, high quality equal to 100. If I set the price of the high quality equal to 100, what's consumer surplus for type Bs? Zero. What's consumer surplus for type Bs if they buy low quality? 10, right? Because their willingness to pay for low quality was 50, 
the price would be 40, they'd walk away with $10 a consumer surplus. Remember, with second degree price discrimination, everybody sees the, the, the full menu of options and chooses which is right for them. So my note here, consumer surplus to the high group when buying the low quality at the price 40 is going to be 50 minus, 10, or minus 40 is equal to 10. So we need the consumer surplus from the high quality to be at least as large. So that's why it can't be, that's why it can't be larger than 90. Why 89? Well, it might make you uncomfortable to say that they're going to buy high quality if the price is 90 because then their consumer surplus is technically exactly the same. So to make them strictly prefer high quality, we might charge a price of like $89.99 or you know, uh, 89 even or, or something like this, or 90, 90 minus epsilon. The point is, though, we need something to tip them in favor of buying, uh, of buying the high quality good. So for an exam, I would want you to give like kind of the closest reasonable number to they're correct in this case like I'd accept 90 I'd accept 90 minus epsilon I'd, I'd accept 89 89 99 and I'd accept 89 88 probably wouldn't accept 85 probably wouldn't accept 91 definitely wouldn't accept so all right so the one issue though is like the real world not quite this simple so what do firms actually do well they'd have to estimate demand curves Think about demand curves for every possible quality level, and then try to find the quality and price combination that maximizes profits. Remember, second degree price discrimination, the information re remains with the consumers. And then they're gonna reveal information about their willingness to pay by virtue of their purchases. And so the firms are gonna be very, very careful to kind of observe this and see what's what preferences individuals are revealing by virtue of the purchasing pattern they make. So my co last comment, because it's complicated, sometimes done by more casual experimentation to see which combinations work best in practice. Combinations are important because, remember, we've got this menu that you're constructing. Both consumers, or both types of consumers, or the multiple types of consumers in the real world are going to see all the prices. And so it's going to matter what those prices are and then how far they are from each other because the relevant levels of consumer surplus that you might have, such as... Uh, in this example right here, where you'd have some degree of consumer surplus from buying the low quality, but we want you to have more consumer surplus as the type B consumer buying the high quality because that's going to maximize profits for the firm. Anyway, that brings us to the end of these slides here. I um, hope you enjoyed this lecture, and I will see you later.